it's going. Okay. See ya. Bye. Good evening, this is Alan Henderson, Executive Director of the National Association of Teachers of Singing. And I'm happy to welcome tonight uh, Rick Walters to talk about a life in the arts. Rick has been a mover and a shaker in the music publishing world for nearly 40 years. He's been a wonderful partner with Nats and with so many teachers and singers not only in North America, but around the world. I think you'll find tonight during our conversation, many things that you probably didn't know about Rick's career and about the immense influence he has had on our industry, on the publishing industry, and uh, on music uh, worldwide through his performances, his recordings, his publications, and then just his leadership and thought leadership uh, throughout our industry. So welcome, Rick. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Alan. I know a lot of people uh, today have certainly first come into contact with you or your name through Hal Leonard, but there was a Rick Walters before Hal Leonard. So let's talk a little bit about that before we really get into how Leonard publishing, uh, the way the industry has changed in 40 years, and all those kinds of things. So tell us a little bit about uh, your upbringing, your musical development, and how you ended up uh, in a career in publishing. Well, I, uh, I spent my young years studying piano from the age of seven. And then I went to do a piano degree at Simpson College. And I studied with Robert Larson as a piano teacher and also vocal coaching there. And uh, I played opera her rehearsals, something I never guessed I would be doing. And uh, opera, scene, opera scene recitals. Uh, that I learned about opera and I learned how much I loved opera, really in those scene recitals. Then after college, I went to University of Minnesota and studied uh, composition with Dominic Argento, who was brilliant. He and I became friends. I stayed there four years. I didn't want to, to leave. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I didn't really imagine I would get a doctorate because what was the point? I mean, you know, I would wind up in South Dakota or somewhere teaching composition and theory. But Dominic and I bonded. And, uh, he, I was his friend till he died. I was asked to speak at his memorial service. And, uh, but he was a brilliant, brilliant man and loved music of all kinds. Loved, I mean, unlike most composers, he knew music from the past. He knew Mozart, you know. Anyway, so then I was struggling to figure out what I was going to do. And then, Alan, if I'm boring, you cut me off. But uh, So I was working at Schmidt Music in downtown Minneapolis. And I saw in those days a, uh, a, a, a printed out job search and I said freelance arranger for Schmidt for uh, Hal Leonard and I answered that and they asked me to come to Milwaukee 
a word I had never said and an interview, which I thought was kind of odd, you know, thinking about it, that I was asked to interview for a freelance job. But I did it, and then they offered me a job, a full-time job. So I, I did that. And then the first day I was there, I was transcribing, meaning, if you don't know what transcribing means, you listen to the music and you write out sheet music. Ten minutes later, I was transcribing the Thompson Twins album. <laughs> Hold me now, and you love it. You know, so I did that for two years. Wow. So, by happen happenstance, you end up uh, in this world of publishing, um, and. Talk to us a little bit about how you moved from just this kind of freelance copyist, then you get hired full time, and how how you find your way through this uh, this organization. So in 1986, the company made a deal. All of these were all of these changes were deals the company made. We made a deal for Shermer, music sales at that time, bought Shermer, but they didn't want to deal with the print side of Shermer. So our CEO made a deal with them, apparently on a cocktail napkin at, at some place in Manhattan on at the Mayfair Hotel. Place no longer exists. And then who became my boss said, I need a classical person to do this with me. So I want Rick to, to come over with me. So I did that. My first meeting in New York at the Shermer office, <laughs> I'll tell you this, I slid forward on, on the chair and there was a nail and I ripped my pants. <laughs> <laughs> it was so awful. I was so embarrassed. It was the first business meeting I ever went to in New York. And uh, so first of many. So uh, I began, we, not only was Shermer involved, but it brought us many relationships which Shermer had been representative of Ricordi, Salabert, different, different companies that they were distributor of, mm -hmm. many of, most of whom we became owners of later in my career. So uh, it was a way to find, for me, it was a way to find a way into the New York publishing business. So, uh, so they acquire Shermer and, you know, as, as a result, some other relationships develop and, and they, they later get acquired as well. And, uh, Talk, just describe to us a little bit about what comes with that when they acquired it. You know, they were they didn't want to deal with the printing side of things, so that really was a and uh, a, a major portion of the agreement. And then also then the distribution aspect as well, right? Right. I mean, that's been the case of many many deals that they didn't know how to. Do. They didn't have the facility to do it. And it was, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, music sales in London later became Wise Music Group. As a major publisher owner, Ricordi, 
none of these companies had in-house printing. They were hiring it out. And that's true today. Mm -hmm. We have our own printing press in Winona, Minnesota. And uh, we print our own stuff. So it it's it's a big deal that, that we it's a big asset that we have. So mm -hmm. and that really positioned how Leonard so uniquely because of that one particular asset to to be able to serve these other publishers, but also then be able to kind of build on that leverage that they had. Um, right. With, with that particular asset uh, right. to, to be able to do what they could do. Well, you know, I mean, you, you and I have talked about um, kind of the basic non-existence of vocal publishing in the 1980s. So many people who are listening tonight weren't even born in the 1980s. <laughs> so we might <laughs> give them a little history lesson about how hard it was to acquire music. I know when I was in college, uh, I my teacher would assign me a piece. I would go to the college bookstore with this little slip of paper that he had written the title and the publisher and all these kinds of things on. And weeks later, that slip would end up in my mailbox at school, and I would go over the over to the bookstore and buy, pick up my piece of music and pay for it. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore, as we know, rarely. But talk to us about what really existed in the world of kind of voice vocal publishing. In, in the well, I, I really think it goes back to the 60s. You know, uh, Shermer was a family run company. And Shermer was really in, a, in the U.S. the leader in terms of collections, in terms of publishing. And then but and then they were sold uh, in, in the late 60s. By the 70s and 80s, vocal publishing really didn't exist. There was nothing to it. And this is why when I knew the role I was thrust in is not just vocal but other things there was an opportunity and uh, there was a big opportunity and as a, a past uh, accompanist I knew the need practical need that there was things that needed to be done for students that were just not there, you know? And I hated the Coggin International Editions. I hated them. Sorry, Mr. Coggin, and you're dead now, but uh, I hated them. The 40 French art songs, for instance, they were terrible. They were terrible. So many things were terrible. And, uh, the opera anthology, the gray, the gray and red Shermer opera anthology that was done so long ago, it was just not practical. There was Verdi and Wagner arias that the students couldn't use. So I, I asked Robert Larson, who I had studied with, so look, let's make a new opera aria anthology. And so we did. And uh, I don't want to say that I did all the work, but uh, it, it, you know, it was something that changed the landscape. 